Grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our meditation is based on the gospel lesson just read, the feeding of the 4,000. You will see earthly food can sustain earthly life for only so long, but that Jesus offered his life as food for the soul, that through his power over death, you might live forever too. Again, the power of Jesus' life-giving hands. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples to set before them. And they had a few small fishes, and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. So far the text, let us pray. O Lord Jesus, bless thy word that we may trust in thee. Amen. God spoke the words, be fruitful and multiply to every creature, man and animal alike. A command which put into perpetual motion the ability of every living thing to propagate new life of its kind. Chickens lay eggs, cows calve, pigs farrow, fish spawn, and every edible plant bears a seed which you can bury in the ground in expectation of more to sprout up in abundance meaning as you and I multiply and fill the earth, so does our food. Through an intricate design to life, which provides a ceaseless supply of everything you eat or drink. Every hamburger bun comes from some pile of kernels each once with the potential to germinate. Every hamburger had a mother, each Walmart burger to many mothers to count. But in order to make the loaf of bread so key to our miracle this morning, the living grain must first be pulverized to dust before being baked in an oven. Just as fish out of water don't live all that long to be preserved as edible any longer than a day, they need to be salted and dried out in the sun. Once this happens, once the living thing becomes food, you cannot get any more out of it. You can't exactly bury a loaf of bread in the dirt and expect to get a wheat field, can you? Neither can you toss fish jerky back into the water and expect to restock a lake. However self-obvious this thought experiment might be, it should not go without saying that the actual end product which goes into your mouth, having lost the ability to become more, everything you eat is dead. All the food you get from the grocery store, already old and rotting the day you buy it. A fact Jesus points out on one occasion when he miraculously feeds 5,000 fellow Jews, that earthly food prone to death itself can only prolong earthly life so long. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. The same fact which subtly drives the hesitation on the part of Jesus' disciples in our gospel lesson today to ask Jesus to work the same miracle for 4,000 starving pagans. If they're going to die anyway, why prolong the inevitable? The same futility Jesus points out in his wisdom Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink? It had already originally been given to you and me 
to have dominion over living things. Yet after our fall into sin, it's dead stuff. We spend most mental and physical energy obsessing over and chasing after. How much of your soul's daily sustenance is chewing on sins and transgressions which no one can undo? Or gobbling up the buffet line of the dead talk which flows from mouths like ours. As surely as man multiplies on the earth, so too sadly do the number of loved ones you see no more. Failed relationships with those you have to see far more than you'd like. As each bite of food gives you strength to serve first yourself, leaving the living word of the Lord left in our care to become a trash heap of broken commands. No wonder when the Lord's Prayer emphasizes the daily aspect of daily bread, Jesus drives home how this is something you're going to need again as soon as tomorrow. Daily is not eternal. Daily bread can only support your body and life up until the day your flesh, too, becomes food in death. Food for the worms. But in our Gospel lesson today, Jesus not only redeems your daily bread, Jesus proves his power to break the cycle of death entirely. You see, each instance Jesus feeds thousands from but a few loaves and fishes, there's more miracle going on here than might first strike you. Yes, Jesus produces a veritable feast from veritably nothing, a miracle for sure in and of itself, but what Jesus is taking into his hands is food well past dead. And when he does take smashed and baked kernels into his life-giving hands, they multiply as if planted in a field. Dried and shriveled fish as if they spawn eggs, too numerous to count. With one touch, making more of the same as if still throbbing with the perpetual motion of life God originally intended. What a marvelous object lesson for Jesus' saving work among us poor sinners already one foot in the grave. As he explained, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So unlike the rancid vittles on which the sinner's soul typically feeds, his Father's goodness alone sustained each day Jesus labored among us. My meat is to do the will of him who sent me. Refusing to chase food which can only spoil Jesus confessed before the devil the true source of life when he said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And as that word made flesh, Jesus becomes the food your innermost soul most direly needs. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. What does Jesus mean of all this talk of eating me? He goes on to clarify, my flesh is meat indeed. 
just as every hamburger had a mother, so did Jesus, the Son of God born of Mary. And just as your food has to die before it could do your body any good, so too would Jesus have to render his flesh over unto death for it to do your soul any good. The bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. When like living seed, ground and milled into flour, Jesus was pulverized with whips and left to bake beneath the scorching wrath of God. When like a fish out of water, Jesus' final gasps for air paid the full price for your sin and the sin of the whole world up until his lifeless form was caked in spices and left to cure in a tomb. But unlike your flesh and mine, Jesus' body did not rot. As both the Psalms and the Apostle make clear, he whom God raised again saw no corruption, not one bit of decay all in order to transform his death into the unending supply of forgiveness and life. Thus the apostle concludes, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that sleep. This good news of Jesus' power over sin and death, this good news of your righteousness in him is an eternal bread which no daily bread can match. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. A food so filled with life, it gives even your body the ability to bounce back from death. As Job confessed, for I know that because my Redeemer liveth, Though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. All of this, all of this encapsulated in one simple object lesson of feeding thousands of hungry mouths. Though the Psalms give glory to God for everything he touches, thou openest thine hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing, but what baked bread in the hand of Jesus becomes acres upon acres worth and fish jerky a lake's worth more, Jesus takes it one step further that you might believe beyond any shadow of doubt that the same hand which makes dead food teem with life now touches and sustains you unto eternal life. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, quickened to retwitch with life by being joined to a savior whose own flesh quickened back out of the dirt and up into the sky. Even when we were dead in sins, hath God quickened us together with Christ, raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in him. This eating, then, of which Jesus speaks can be nothing other than faith. A living faith which can't help but cause abundant fruit to break out of the barren soil of your heart. A faith which, like everything else God gives life to, has the remarkable ability to propagate more of its kind. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. A commission which gives God's original command, be fruitful and multiply, entirely new purpose. 
being fruitful and multiplying our numbers as Christ believers by simply living out your faith, thereby providing the whole world, your little town included, with true food for the soul. Collectively speaking, this is the banquet of word and sacrament. We provide free for the taking on a regular basis the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. But individually speaking, just as Jesus put his disciples to work in feeding thousands with bread and fish, so he blesses your daily labor no less. Whatever it is you put your hands to in order to provide others with their daily bread and procure your own, now blessed by grace to play an essential, albeit invisible, kingdom role as a harvester of souls and fisher of men. As the all-forgiving hand of Jesus has the power to transform all that dead stuff you chew on and gobble up with your minds and ears into opportunity to repent and grow in him, to offer one another forgiveness, and to devote yourself daily to the living food of the word of the Lord placed in your personal care. Redeeming and blessing even that most carnal act of shoving physical food into your mouth. Yes, today's sermon might have started out a touch morbid, but it is God's design after all for that dead stuff to be what strengthens your physical life. God's design for you to creatively work and recombine it in the most delicious ways. And in the grace of sins forgiven, to partake of it to your heart's content. I can think then of no more fitting way to close than with the words of wise Solomon. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, for God now accepted thy works. Now the peace that passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.